Okay, this morning we move on in our journey to uh, the reality of our world. It all has to do with our own future. And this morning, the man we have, well, in America, he will be a professor. In England, he's just a doctor. But here, we know his real, real face. He's one of us. The famous and only person, as we know him, Jeffrey Stevenson. Give him a hand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lane. Um, those of you who knew me as a mime artist will be perhaps surprised to see me up here giving a lecture. And, um, and uh, I have often uh, said that I uh, was more eloquent on stage when I kept my mouth shut. <laughs> um, but uh, my present research at the University of Edinburgh is in a project that's entitled Peace Building Through Media Arts, Peace Building Through Media Arts. And this has inspired my thoughts for, for this talk about uh, art and social dialogue. So in this lecture, I'm going to be focusing on tensions in the urban workplace caused by suspicion and prejudice between different groups of different racial or ethnic or social identity. And I'll be suggesting that Addressing these problems requires social dialogue, forms of social dialogue that seek to build trust, to build respect, and to build hope, as well as addressing issues of injustice, where injustice has become structural or institutionalized. Now, to, in to, uh, to illustrate this, I'm going to be looking at a specific problem in a particular Scottish city. Um, sorry, Rotterdam. Uh, the problem is um, sectarianism, sectarianism, and by sectarianism I mean the adherence to the markers and signs of a social group defined by its religious identity. Adherence to the markers and signs of a social group defined by its religious identity. I'll talk more about that, um, to, to be sure. And this, in this case I will be referring to Catholic and Protestant expressions of Christianity. And the city... Well, the city is Glasgow in Scotland. And uh, for those of you who can't quite place it, uh, Scotland's up in the north of the British Isles and Glasgow's over on the southwest of Scotland there. In this lecture, I'll be arguing that art has a part to play in promoting social dialogue, and it can do so by helping divided communities to develop necessary virtues of uh, respect um, based on empathy and by helping the divided communities to reimagine the future, to reimagine the future. This is the key contribution, I think, of art to peace building, is inspiring imagination, empathy, and respect. Um, and uh, I, um, uh, because the future has to be different from the present current cycles of violence, mistrust, intimidation, etc. So I will make a call to artists to work at the local level to give a voice to the voiceless. And these artists, of course, in turn re require support and space in order to imagine alternative futures, futures that will be marked by shared values of creativity, of cooperation, of justice, of grace, and of hope. Creativity, cooperation, justice, grace, and hope. Well, is uh, sectarianism an old problem? Of course it is. Uh, we may see the fear of the other, the mistrust, the suspicion, as a failure to accept and to care for the stranger. In the Old Testament scriptures, Shared by Christian, Jew, and Muslim, we read, You are to have the same law for the foreigner and the native born. I am the Lord your God, from Leviticus and from Deuteronomy. When you gather the grapes of the vineyard, do not glean what is left. Do not take it away. Thank you. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. 
So we see that the problem is as old as the Bible itself. And it is worth reminding ourselves that even the people Israel, called by God to develop and to maintain a strong identity as a, as a people special to him, even Israel is commanded not to oppress the alien and to give them every protection of their own law system. How? I have to ask at the beginning of this lecture, has it happened that so many Christian nations have failed to protect the alien in their midst? Sometimes the alien is Jewish, sometimes Catholic, sometimes Muslim. Living in their midst, they have been unprotected and worse. Now, society is under pressure from uh, economic migration, economic migration relocating to find work, happening across the U EU, and every city has to absorb strangers. There are huge numbers in some cities. Think of the banlieue, the suburbs of, of Paris, or Rotterdam, where immigrant groups exceed 50% of the population, it's now estimated. Such inflows place crippling strains on the infrastructure, um, housing, schooling, provision of benefits. And they lead to tense collisions in cultural expressions, language, customs, legal practice. Where one of my grandsons um, attends nursery school in Edinburgh, there are more Polish-speaking children than Scots. There are areas in the UK where Sharia law operates, and sometimes, although rarely, it's practiced and obeyed at variance even with British law. Social problems can be intense. Recently arrived, without money, immigrants can fall victim to landlords who exploit or fall into crime, alcohol, drug dependency. They are at the harsh end of public spending cuts, the first to find that they don't qualify for benefits. And then when mixed with a local population who are themselves mired in long-term unemployment, there is potential for civic unrest. Racial, ethnic classes clashes as newcomers are perceived as taking jobs. This, as I say, is not a new problem, although new solutions may be required. Urban communities have always been vulnerable to larger economic forces as neighborhoods are created and destroyed and people living in them dispersed and regrouped by factors way beyond their control. So let me tell you a story. Uh, in 1847, an Irish political leader named Daniel O'Connell, sometimes called the champion of liberty for Irish freedom, the man who had campaigned vigorously for most of his life against the union of Great Britain and Ireland, he addressed the British Parliament in London. This was his last public speech. He would be dead within a year of a brain illness. And in his once powerful voice, now hardly audible, he pleaded, Ireland is in your hands, in your power. If you do not save her, she cannot save herself. I solemnly call upon you to recollect that I predict with the sincerest conviction that a quarter of her population will perish unless you come to her relief. O'Connell's utmost concern in his final years was the great famine which now plagued his country. Beginning in 1845 and lasting for six years, the potato famine killed over a million men, women, and children in Ireland and caused another million to flee the country. The potato was, of course, the staple crop in the poorest regions of a poor country. And more than three million Irish peasants subsisted solely on the vegetable, which is, has protein, carbohydrates, minerals. Now, normally the crop matures in September or October, was stored, eaten throughout the winter, and then became edible by July, which meant that there was the yearly summer hunger and saw women and children begging on the roadside and their menfolk traveling across the Irish Sea for temporary work in the harvest fields of England. The widespread poverty had been exacerbated, it has to be said, by a century or more of British anti-Catholic policies and by the growing 19th century industrialization in Britain, which brought about the collapse of the less efficient Irish linen and woolen industries with their hand looms. The potato blight began insidiously and mysteriously in the autumn of 1845, when the leaves on the potato plants started to blacken and curl. Potatoes dug out of the ground at first, they looked edible, but shriveled and rotted within days. The blight quickly spread, affecting the country's entire harvest within months. 
Now, if the British management of Ireland was marked before the famine by anti-Catholic stigmatization and by insular self-interest, the story of the management of the country during the famine years is enough to make you seethe with anger. There were token efforts to import American maize or corn, but it was too little, too late, and too indigestible. There was an almost criminal belief in the powers of the free market to provide work and pay and affordable imports. And there were official laissez-faire policies, meaning let it be, that proved criminally inadequate when the crops failed three out of the following four years. The famine is still controversial in Irish history. The debate continues on how much the British government's response to the situation constituted an act of genocide. And this is a picture of Ireland's Holocaust Memorial, Holocaust mural on Ballymurphy Road in Belfast in Northern Ireland, and Gorta Moore, Britain's Genocide by Starvation, Ireland's Holocaust, 1845 to 1849. It is in the great tradition of Irish wall murals that are intimately related to community suffering. Well, many were paid to emigrate to the British colonies in Canada, the poorest of the poor boarded steamers. They crossed the Irish Sea to Liverpool, to South Wales, and Glasgow in the west of Scotland. It was a short trip, just two or three hours, and cost only a few shillings. This is a picture from the Famine Memorial in Dublin. It's located at Custom House Quays. The thin sculptural figures by artist Rowan Gillespie are portrayed as if walking towards the emigration ships on the Dublin quayside, their life size. A moment for you to take those in. The point of my story is that there are today traumas such as this that still throw people into refugee status, sending them around the globe, often to places where they are not welcome, but where they come out of desperation. They have been dispossessed and disenfranchised, and they arrive destitute. The residents often have problems of their own, so they resent the newcomers. They have no motivation to welcome the immigrants. In the case of the Irish, they were feared for the fever they were carrying. Some ships arrived in Canada with dozens dead. The Roman Catholic Irish were stigmatized for their religion. Furthermore, they were despised by the Protestant Scots for lacking the same work ethic as they had. But is the situation that dissimilar for Syrians crossing into Turkey and Jordan, for Sri Lanka, Somalia, Sudan, San Salvador, and that's just the countries beginning with S. According to the UN, by the end of 2011, an estimated 43 million people worldwide were forcibly displaced due to conflict and persecution. But returning to my story, there had been, as I said, a seasonal emigration to England and to Scotland for work during harvest. But between 1841 and 1851, the Irish population increased by 90%. In this map, you might not be able to see it very well, but uh, the, uh, because of their poverty and their poor state of health, the uh, Irish immigrants tended to settle in or around their point of disembarkation, which meant the west coast of Scotland. While greater numbers made their way to England, settling in and around London and uh, Liverpool, in Scotland they formed a far greater percentage of the population. Glasgow, uh, Paisley, uh, Edinburgh and Dundee were particular centres. Now the Catholic Irish men settled for the most part where muscle and hard labour was in demand, industries such as coal mining, dock work. And by 1851, Irish women, for their part, made up 44% of the textile workers in Greenock, near Glasgow. But in many areas, they were underrepresented in the more highly paid, skilled trades due to their lack of education and, in many cases, their language, which was Gaelic. So there were a range of reasons why the immigrants were shunned and feared. Their language, the fever they were thought to carry, their poverty, their feeble condition, and, um, where strong enough, their threat to employment in the lower status jobs. But there is no doubt that religion also was a significant factor in the resentment and the hostility the immigrants experienced. Since the Reformation, Scotland had been 
a Protestant country, and Catholicism was viewed as a threat to the fabric of society, as well as anti-Catholic laws passed by the British government, attacks on the Irish became commonplace in newspapers, on the streets, and from the pulpits. As late as 1923, the Church of Scotland could still publish a pamphlet entitled The Menace of the Irish to Our Scottish Nationality. The Irish were seen as drunken, idle, uncivilized, and undermining the moral fiber of Scottish society. But they were there to stay. As one report put it, the Irish Catholics demonstrated a tremendous capacity to build sustainable local communities. There was a strong level of intermarriage, that is, amongst themselves, it contributed to a very slow rate of assimilation into the mainstream of Scottish society. They clustered in close-knit communities, preserving the customs, celebrating the traditions, religious and secular, of the extended family groups back home. You only have to look at, extended, at immigrant communities from the Caribbean, from the Indian subcontinent, from Eastern Europe, to see the patterns replicated. Well, I'm going to look at a particular example of conflict between descendants of these immigrants. So I'm going to talk about sectarianism and then about some arts-based attempts to address the issue. Because I think it has parallels with religious and non-religious situations of tension and conflict in many European cities today. But the term sectarianism is, is not so simple to define within the orbit of the social problems and the varying manifestations linked to the term. In 2008, there was a study of sectarianism for the Scottish government. It was principally based on a focus group, on, it was based on focus group discussions in Glasgow city workplaces, right? So they talked to the workers. And through the study, three different aspects of sectarianism were identified. There was anti-Catholic prejudice and discrimination. There was anti-Protestant prejudice prejudice and discrimination, and there was just anti-Irish prejudice, which takes the form, and it's not putting it too strongly, of anti-Irish racism. And the study concluded that in practice considerable uncertainty surrounds these terms. There was confusion between pejorative and non-pejorative. Do you know what I mean? Pejorative being insulted or demeaning, and non-pejorative, just plain banter. Uh, Simple difference, innocent language, teasing between workmates. When linked to religion, this could be seen as sectarian, or maybe not. Um, it's hard to draw a line. In the focus group, commonly participants presented the problem as being between Protestants and Catholics, but after considerable discussion, um, this led to the identification of other relevant factors. And in particular, these were associations with Ireland, and the interrelationships between Britain and Ireland. Other studies have concluded that religion is not itself the source of community conflict. In Northern Ireland, where of course the division between Catholic and Protestant has been associated with much more extreme forms of violence, terrorism, state oppression, a community relations council in 2003 concluded that the, the, the dispute is about allegiance to Britain and Britishness and to Ireland and Irishness. So please keep this point in mind as we look at a particularly visible example of sectarianism. And I know this will be foreign and strange to many of you. I'm going to talk about <coughs> football. <coughs> um, Rangers versus Celtic. Rangers versus Celtic. Um, a specific place or an arena, literally, for sectarian-fueled violence is the competition between the two main professional football teams in Glasgow, Rangers and Celtic. Celtic was one of several identifiably Catholic teams set up in Scotland to cater for the late 19th century working-class obsession with the sport. Now, there are non-problematic support bases, support bases that around the world that don't give a problem. But in Glasgow and in the west of Scotland, Rangers are historically native Scots and Protestant Irish from Ulster, the north of Ireland, while Celtics fans are drawn largely from Irish Catholic backgrounds. It's revealing the two national flags waved by the supporters, rarely the Scottish flag. Celtic fans, Celtic fans tend to wave uh, the Irish tricolor, Rangers tend to wave the British Union Jack. And together the two teams and their rivalry for more than 100 years have been known as 
the old firm. Remember that, you'll be in the know. The old firm. If you go to Glasgow, just say, I want to find out about the old firm. But be careful which neighborhood you ask. <laughs> the rivalry has been fierce, particularly in the last hundred years. Violent behavior towards opposing fans is common, not just in the stadium, but in streets and bars and city before and after the match and in the homes. According to one report, in the hours after the final whistle was blown in an old firm match in 2011, domestic violence rose by 81%. Most notoriously opposing fans fought a running on-pitch battle in the aftermath of Celtic's 1-0 victory in the 1980 Scottish Cup final. A match commentator described the riot. The pitch swarmed with fans attacking each other with bricks and bottles as well as iron bars and wooden staves from the terracing. This is a scene now out of apocalypse now. We've got the equivalent of Passchendaele and that says nothing for Scottish football. At the end of the day, let's not kid ourselves, these supporters hate each other. In, uh, in uh, Les Gray, the head of the Scottish Police Foundation, called for the games between the two clubs to be banned. The football, he said, was not worth the murder and mayhem that the games unleashed. Of course, intense rivalry between rival football fans happens all over the world, not just in Scotland. But the violence in Scotland is clearly fueled by sectarian attitudes that are deeply rooted in Scottish society. So it's been noted that offensive language is still used in Scotland on a daily basis, not just between football supporters. Abusive terms such as hun and orange bastard being used negatively against Protestants or those perceived to be, and others such as Fenian and Tim used negatively against Catholics. You will see, still see graffiti about Irish politics in some places in Scotland. You might still be unwelcome at the local golf or bowling club because of your surname. And when you marry someone whose family are from a different sect within Christianity, you might still to this day experience more disapproval than you had expected to. I know myself of a Church of Scotland, Protestant minister, who left the ministry because his congregation would not accept it, the idea of his children attending a local Roman Catholic school. Well, answers to this problem, according to a, an anti-speech, anti, sorry, anti-hate speech group called Nil by Mouth, the problems associated with religious conflict are being examined and confronted across society by schools, by community groups, by academics, by football clubs such as Celtic and Rangers, football governing bodies, national and local governments, churches, charities, museums, galleries, and a growing number of individuals across the nation. Well, hooray. I mean, good, good. Let me look at one particular e example. A popular and often performed play that addresses the hatred between Rangers and Celtic supporters was written in 2005 sing called Singing, I'm Noah Billy, He's a Tim. Singing, I'm Noah Billy, that is uh, Billy uh, for Prince William, King William of Orange, I'm Noah uh, Protestant, uh, he's a Tim. Uh, Tim standing for... Uh, Catholic, written and directed by Des Dillon, a hard-hitting drama. It makes rather uncomfortable viewing for middle-class audiences, not least for its, um, shall I say, true-to-life language. Uh, uh, in fact, I had to search quite hard for a clip that I could show this morning that would not be too <laughs> offensive, but, but I think it's worth taking the risk because we need to be very, very aware of the reality of the worlds we are considering. So in the first clip you're going to see, the Rangers supporter is called Billy. He's in a blue shirt with a British Union Jack on his sleeve. The supporter of Celtic is a Catholic who's called Tim, which is an ordinary name, but happens to be one of the slang names used by Protestants for Catholics, along with Fenny and Bastard and a good number of others that are unprintable. <laughs> the, the two lads have been arrested for unrelated offenses on the morning of a big match between the old firm and they are devastated to be missing the match. What's more upsetting is to find themselves sharing a cell. And it's only the threat of being caught on the, CCC, on the CCTV that keeps them from physical assault on one another. So in this clip, and I don't expect you to follow the dialogue, but I'll get you, it'll give you a flavor, it's a minute long. Billy is trying to persuade the warden to lend him his phone so that he can 
make a bet on his side winning the match. Uh, because if his bet is good, he'll be able to post the bail and he'll be able to get out. So let's just see how we do with this clip. Don't worry about the language. I mean, understanding it. <laughs> so there they are in, uh, in, in the cell. Harry. Mm. <laughs> what was it you were saying about what he done? Ask him. Well, I'm not talking to him. <laughs> I'm not talking to him. I'm asking you. Get his wife to put money on Celtic to win. Don't know what you mean. <laughs> Celtic win, his wife pays his fine with his winnings, and he's out. Oh. See, I'm not as daft as you look, you pie muncher. <laughs> Hey, but how am I going to get a bet on for here? Oh, there's a lad Brooks in the next cell. <laughs> Fuck up, you, right? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Oh, come on, one phone call. Anyone found out by my phone? Well, well, you can say he dropped it then. In here, when we were fighting. Oh, come on, Harry, I wouldn't say nothing. It'd really mean a lot to you, eh? Oh, cheers, me. Are you fucking kidding me, Harry? <laughs> Fuck's sake. I know your team, you cunt. <laughs> Okay, there. <clears throat> did you get all that? I didn't think you would, but it gives you a, f a feel for the character. He's trying, to, he's trying to get the phone so he can place a bet for himself. Well, they are uh, desperate to watch the match. Um, eventually, the warden turns a television towards the hatch in their cell door so that they can take turns going up to the hatch and watching the match. As the play unfolds, they begin to discover that underneath what they recognize as their bigotry, they have much more in common than they dreamed. Both are married, they have two children or wains, uh, both have mixed family backgrounds. It turns out that Billy was born a Catholic, but when his mother left, his mother, when his father left, his mother raised him to be a Rangers supporter. And Tim, it turns out, for all the Irishness of his people, had only ever been to Protestant Northern Ireland because he had a Protestant mother. But the warden has problems of his own. His four-year-old grandson, we learn, is in hospital having a tricky operation. At one point, we see him bow his head and we hear him pray, although it's something he's clearly not used to doing. Later in the play, he tells the two lads that although the operation went okay, his grandson had a bad reaction to the anesthetic, and this clear suffering brings out the latent spirituality of the prisoners who, in their own way, in this next clip, turn to prayer. Extraordinary to see this on the mainline uh, Scottish stage. Extraordinary. The operation went fine, but... Jesus, Harry. I've been praying all day. Yeah, well, well, we'll say a prayer for you then, if, if that's all right with you. What is what? It could only help, eh? Aye, that's no bother to us, eh, Tim? Thanks. I've got to be a phone. I know. Imagine that was one of your wings. Aye. Aye. Well, just, um, I'll just. Well, I can't you fucking staring at me, can I? Could <laughs> I turn your back or something? Here, don't use that prayer used alone for fuck's sake. <laughs> Yeah. 
fear God. A prayer for Harry's grandson. Here, did he say his name? No. Dear God, I pray for Harry's grandson that he'll be all right in his operation. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, he says. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Bless thou amongst women, and bless is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of our death. Amen. <laughs> What is it? It turns out that his, his wife has, put, has also put money on the wrong team to win. <laughs> the play ends with good news. The little boy is going to be okay. Uh, and bad news for the lads. The game is a 1-1 draw. Neither win their bets, and they face spending the rest of the weekend in jail. But in a heartwarming turn, the jailer pays their bail money, mainly so he can get out and see his family, because they're the last ones left in jail for the weekend. <laughs> and so they're free to go. They've swapped their football tops. They've made a friend. It would be almost unbelievable, but in the course of the play, you know, you believe that such understanding is possible. And, uh, and it's a little symbol. It's a little... A uh, hopeful sign. It's a moment of grace that marks uh, an incredibly hopeful and a spiritual piece of theater. So this is, example is, is one that has as its aims to change attitudes, to overcome blind and unthinking prejudice. And it works through the time-honored method of, of showing empathy and of creating empathy and by demonstrating that what unites us is far greater and more important than what divides us. <clears throat> it is a powerful statement, but it is a statement, a message designed to be heard by a passive a receiving audience for the most part. But arts, of course, can be employed in other ways at grassroots levels, in ways that seek to develop communities and to bridge divides in much more experiential ways. Participants from divided or hostile communities are brought together in uh, artistic enterprises, leading to the breaking down of barriers and to the growth of trust and understanding. So I just want to look at a couple of other examples from the west of Scotland, or at least to tell you, tell you about them. Um, Faith uh, in uh, Community Scotland uh, is an anti-poverty organization founded in 2005. The board, the staff, the uh, Volunteers are a dynamic team from across Christian, Jewish, Muslim, and Sikh communities. And they share a commitment to reduce poverty in Scotland. Often their work is at a grassroots level, building relationships across the divisions, using the arts as a locus. Their community choir is called the Children's Cantata, for instance, composed of members of Roman Catholic, Church of Scotland, and Methodist churches uh, in Milton and Glasgow. Well, you can imagine the interesting mix of parents at one of their concerts. Another project that marries uh, theme and process is Interfaith Glasgow and um, the uh, West of Scotland Regional Equality Council, WSREC. Um, they have a project called Stepping into Diversity uh, Youth Filmmaking, which is for the establishment of a group of young people from ages of 14 to 17, to make short films about diverse experiences of faith in Glasgow. So by early uh, next year, the group will have put together two short films, one giving an insight into the faith experiences of young people in Glasgow, and another showcasing positive examples of interfaith work. I can't wait to see those results because, of course, um, there's a huge uh, interest in filmmaking in, in uh, amongst uh, young, young people. 
Another project that same group ran uh, recently was done with a photographer named uh, Liz Hingley. She has a long-running uh, work called Spiritual Object Studio. I don't like the name, but it tells you what it's about. She invites people to have a photographic portrait of themselves holding an object of personal spiritual significance. And when this uh, is hosted by an organization such as Interfaith Scotland, there's a huge potential for cooperation and understanding that leaps across boundaries of race and religion, as I hope you can get a glimpse of from uh, this news picture. I want to finish uh, this lecture with <coughs> uh, a new voice. Um, <laughs> with a, a brief look at some of this photographer's other work. Not from uh, Glasgow, as it happens, but from uh, Birmingham, England's second biggest city. And here she uh, addresses um, not uh, uh, Christian differences, but interfaith differences. She's concerned not with doctrine and beliefs, but with people and practices. Here, hers is art that addresses religious difference and fear of the other. So just to look at, at four of her pictures before we close. This picture from a Sikh wedding is a delightful a riot of color, a wonderful image of six women close together but miles apart, caught in a decisive moment as only the camera can record. Okay. This is a picture of uh, the, a baptism at Cannon Street Baptist Church. It's both familiar and exciting uh, to me because until you've been in an Afro-Caribbean service, I don't think you know what heart, mind, and soul worship feels like. This uh, picture disturbs me, Alka Jane's personal prayer room. Alka Jane, uh, she's praying outside her own room because she is in her unclean period. The only thing allowed in the room are her devotional books. And yet, consider the viewpoint of the photographer and therefore of us. I, the viewer, I'm allowed inside her personal prayer room. What's that about? Uh, but then going further, maybe it makes me question my uh, liberal attitudes. Who am I, after all, that I should judge another person's practice of her religion? And finally, Mrs. Little's home communion a home group of an Anglican church meets to pray and sing hymns and celebrate communion. It's full of ordinary, simple faith. It's full of humanity. It's full of infirmity and problems. It's full of a practice that can sustain. I love these photographs for showing me inside the hearts of those people with their gentleness, their vulnerability, their simplicity, their humanity. If I met them on the street, or if I thought they were taking my job, or if I thought they didn't know how to recycle their rubbish properly, I might despise them or even fear them. But a photographer with empathy and compassion and affection is able to portray their humanity and so build empathy and maybe even humanity in me, the viewer. Well, in my talk, I, 
I hope I've demonstrated that European cities have, have always faced the problem of multiculturalism and that to our shame we have not always protected the foreigner, the stranger, the other, the alien. We have too easily allowed local communities and entrenched social groups to bully and to claim protected status because they got there first, um, because they have the loudest voices, because they are in God's will. Underlying this is often fear, and often the fears are justified. One example, the Celtic and Rangers was drawn from two groups who've been at each other's throats for generations, even though they share a common racial and ethnic heritage, and even claim the same founder for their religion. Now, I do not mean to underestimate the challenge when barriers of language, of culture, of custom, and color of skin prevent dialogue when these things prevent a shared participation in what we call the common wheel, working for the common good of the larger society. There are huge problems. Laws have to be passed with painful penalties to restrict crimes of hate. Laws must be passed to ensure justice and equal rights. Education in mixed schools must address the lack of involvement in society and must fight against the disengagement from practices that bind us together, whether they're in politics or entertainment. But I believe that art has a role to play in this or several related roles. So it can be a mouthpiece for those who do not have a voice, crying for justice through the production of plays and the exhibition of artists coming from minority communions, communities. I'm sorry. It can be an experience of community when amateur concerts, productions, and workshops bring together participants from divided communities. And it can help us to imagine, to picture together a future where anger is replaced by grace, and picture a future that is better than the present. Creativity, cooperation, justice, grace, and hope. Society is under pressure. These are five small words to sum up a very big program. I don't know how they are being translated right now into other languages here this morning, but I know it is not that difficult to translate them, and it's not that difficult to agree on their importance. Well, we must go further. We must embrace these words. We must act. We must paint, compose, sculpt, play, and work with these words ringing in our ears, taking root in our hearts. Thank you for listening to my modest attempt to bring them to your attention this morning. Thank you.